Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see everybody up here, uh, from up here again. And I know that Rebecca, my wife, was here just with you all last month for a couple of times, and twice, and then an art workshop. And you know, the first the first message she gave was <laughs> was on was on the topic of of uh, the power of storytelling and Jesus being the goat. And her second message was diving into you know, one of the parables of the wheat and tear. And also, she facilitated an art workshop, and I really appreciated some of the artwork that she had photos of. And my favorite was one where someone made uh, an ice cream, uh, given that's my favorite thing right now. Um, time, time really flies, because the last time I was up here, I realized when I was preparing for this message was actually <laughs> last October. So it's, it's already been a little over a year. And for that message, I actually prepared one called Lightning Our Yokes. Uh, if some of you are here, you remember that in Acts 15, I talked about how we sometimes put on additional individual and corporate yokes on ourselves. And these are the additional spiritual restrictions that we prescribe ourselves that kind of hinder our spiritual faith journeys. Um, but instead, Jesus prescribes to us that he is lightening our yokes and that he will give us greater joy and freedom because we can know that we have these lighter loads that we carry and he's helping us carry them. At the end of the message, uh, I mentioned that even though we're afforded greater freedom and greater joy, there's still a yoke that we have to carry, uh, a lighter one, but we're still expected to maintain uh, proper conduct, behavior, and live our lives that uh, are in a way glorifying to him. <clears throat> uh, carrying this yoke, doing this work, still requires a degree of focus, intention, and discipline. Uh, I really appreciate coming here because Pastor Mark always gives me freedom to choose whatever topic I, I want to preach up here. And it wasn't my intention to actually tie in what I talk about today with the, um, the message that I prepared before, but it kind of it ties in together. So uh, I really kind of like that it worked out this way. I, I've been praying about what message to give, and this, uh, the message today is what I got, and it happens to still connect with uh, what I did last time. So anything we do, especially focus work, requires a level of preparation, training, and right mindset. Um, our message today comes from 1 Corinthians 9.24-27, to and the sermon title, as you guys saw, is uh, do you even lift bra? Um, the passage today is from 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, and I'll, and I'll read it. I know it's a little bit small for you all, but uh, I'll read it. Uh, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Uh, in Rebecca's presentation and messages, she prepared very beautiful uh, slides. I'm sorry mine will disappoint because they're uh, not nearly as elegant. Actually, they're the opposite. They're, they're very, very crude. Um, but I lean more kind of your common pop culture cliche uh, visual tool. So hopefully some of you uh, will appreciate. And I know there's a broad age and generational range here. Uh, some probably uh, as young as high school or college and those that might even be retired. And so I know that my, my title requires a little bit of explanation for, for those especially that uh, don't know what it actually means. Uh, the phrase, do you even lift bra, is actually a mocking question used toward people who attempt to look or act capable in something but actually aren't. Case in point is, is someone like this guy, right? I think that he's presenting this persona of a lifter, uh, very athletic, but I think uh, some of us question whether or not he has the ability. Um, it's often used against people who want to give this, this phrase is often used against people who, who give the impression that they're you know, really strong and athletic, but in fact, they, they look very foolish, and we kind of quickly see, see through their kind of facade. 
um, because those who actually engage in something like lifting or athletic, uh, athletic training know that it requires a lot of focus and a lot of preparation and, and training. Um, I don't know the closest Mandarin translation to this uh, particular phrase, but I know that in Cantonese there used to be something that a lot of, a lot of people use in the movies, uh, in Hong Kong movies. It's, it's like lemo quali ga, and so that question is, do you have the qualifications? Um, and, and actually, it kind of points out to someone like, you know, you kind of try to look the part of something, but do you actually have the backing, the credentials to support the, the persona that you're presenting? Um, when I mention these ideas, I, I'm sure some of you have some memories that come to mind of your own experiences. In, in my case, I remember years ago when I was still going to the gym. Um, I don't go to the gym anymore. I have two kids and I have a puppy now, so all I do is just take care of them, and, and that's sufficient enough exercise for me. But I remember that um, there was a time when I was going to the gym, and this was at Export on State Street, and I was there for an hour with my friend, and I was lifting weights, and there was a guy that came in, and he, he had full tracksuit, he had a headband, he brought his gym bag, and he was ready to look like, well, he looked like he was ready to lift, but in fact, he sat down at the bench press, and he pulled out a whole chicken dinner out of his bag with a cup of soda, and he just proceeded to eat dinner at the gym. Um, for the whole hour I was there, he, he didn't even do one exercise. He, he was just sitting and enjoying his meal. So um, that, for me, is like the perfect example of when you would use the question, do you even lift, bruh? Because this guy is coming in and, you know, showing his, showing his athleticism, but really there, there isn't very much of it. Uh, in our passage, Paul uses the visual image of running. And this is a metaphor, an image that connects the idea uh, with our own spiritual journeys, our spiritual walks. He says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. He's calling us to keep our faith muscles well-conditioned and activated uh, for the Lord's work and for our um, our faith journeys. Paul highlights that our faith journey is demonstrated through action and not just a cognitive process that happens in our minds. Um, living out our faith is more than the mental belief, belief that God uh, exists in identifying Jesus as our Savior. Uh, it requires a manifestation of our faith through our actions. We're not just thinking about, you know, what we know as truth. We're, we're living it out. It's not a basic matter of belief through intellectual insight, but it's an actively engaging process. And Paul, in our passage, uses this metaphor to connect this for his original audience. Um, but it also really kind of ties into what we understand in our modern times as well. Paul's audience is the Corinthian church. And the believers are in Corinth, which was a major Greek commercial city uh, in his time. The idea of running a race was actually very familiar to them because they had a long history of holding what were known as the Isthmian Games. And these were the games that I think that our Olympics are actually modeled after. These games happened every two years, and athletic as well as musical competitors from all of Greece would descend upon Corinth and compete in honor of Poseidon. Uh, this happened since like 582 BC, so by the time Paul was using this example of running a race, uh, people were already familiar with this for centuries. Uh, Paul takes an idea that the Corinthians understand and, use them, and uses it to help them visualize a right perspective of Christian living. Paul turns around the idea as well of this big competition being in honor of Poseidon and instead attributes what we do for God's honor and glory and for his service. Throughout his letter to the Corinthians, Paul addresses uh, a laundry list of specific matters that range from addressing disorderly church conduct and leadership to divisions to sexual immorality in the church. He addresses uh, things like lawsuits among believers, divorce, um, sexual immorality. And I mentioned before that Corinth was this uh, important city of commerce in Corinth. And to make a comparison, it's, it's not unlike Hong Kong or New York or London. It was a major port city where there was a lot of trade. 
And with trade in these places, it wasn't just a trade of physical goods, but trade of physical ideas and culture and beliefs as well. And with any big city, we know there's big city problems. And Corinth was definitely experiencing this as well. Uh, the church was, by comparison to the Jewish churches in kind of the Israeli uh, regions, uh, not as grounded in moralistic traditions and that culture that they had for a very long time. And so uh, with a younger church like the Corinthian church, you have leaders and followers that are just kind of understanding the outside world um, and are not as mature, and they're bringing in the ideas that they understand from their usual conditioning into the church. And so Paul is writing the church to address the deficiencies in their theology and their practices. Paul addressed topics that are very much practical, and um, he steers away from the idea, again, of a passive idea of our faith and just understanding it as a concept. His belief was demonstrated by him, um, well, his, like looking at Abraham, our original kind of forefather of the faith. Uh, we know that God credited his faith as righteousness to him. But this it wasn't just him believing. It was backed by action. And we know that Abraham left everything that he knew. He left his family, his home, and he went to an unknown place uh, where God even called him to sacrifice his son and he was obedient. Uh, so he didn't just believe, he demonstrated his belief through action. And what I'm saying is that genuine faith is exhibited through consistent action. And this is a way that we serve and glorify God. Uh, the race that Paul refers to is his race to fulfill the mission of God, to proclaim the gospel to as many people as he can and to save as many as he can. And I'm not trying to present the idea that, oh, we're trying to earn our way to salvation. We are justified as soon as we believe. This is a demonstration of what uh, real faith is because it's consistent with how we act. It's not just what we say. I think the example of loving someone is, is a very helpful one in, in showing this. Uh, authentic love is reinforced by how you express it. So if I tell my children that I love them, but I don't spend time with them, to do the things they like, I don't support them, I don't encourage them. I can't say that my love is really genuine. Uh, in the same way, thinking that just belief in God is enough is not enough. Uh, we have to demonstrate it through action because even Satan and the demons believe in God and they fear him. If we're looking at the act of running as a metaphor for our faith journey, there are spe uh, specific spiritual practices in our lives that then represent our spiritual muscles, so to speak. Um, these are our actions like <clears throat> our prayer life, our devotions, our grounding ourselves in God's word. And like muscles, these areas need to be developed over time and conditioned as well so that we can run like an athlete, so that we can do the work God calls us to do. In our, in our physical bodies, when our bodies are not engaged in activity and using our muscles, do you know what happens? Uh, there's something called atrophy that happens. The muscle starts to weaken and it starts to diminish. And because the body deems these muscles as non-essential because we're not using them, it just degenerates and fades away. Um, this is especially visible, I think, in, in older folks where they're just less active and so their muscles begin to shrink and they just become smaller. But this can happen with younger folks too. If any of you have broken a limb, like a, an arm or a leg, and you put a cast on, and then at the end of your healing and you take away the cast, like that arm or that leg on one side is gonna be smaller than the one on the other side because it's atrophied. And likewise, with our spiritual condition, our spiritual practices, if we don't keep engaged in things like reading God's word and grounding ourselves in prayer and fellowship and these type of actions, we also will begin to kind of degenerate in our spiritual strength and our spiritual muscle. When we engage in training and keeping ourselves sharp and ready, we'll be able to handle times of stress and even take advantage of times of opportunity. Uh, there's something called muscle memory. Some of you might know it if you guys are athletes, and it happens where when through repeated training of something and action, your body just begins to know what to do in specific situations where you trained it to do something. Because your body 
reverts back to its conditioning uh, when you might not be thinking about how to react in a certain situation. This is why athletes and soldiers train and train and train, because in times of pressure and urgency, when we don't have the time to think about a certain uh, action we want to take in a situation, our body naturally, intuitively responds in the way that we've trained it. Uh, likewise, as we engage in prayer and worship and grounding ourselves in God's word, uh, when there are times of crises, we will naturally go to do what we've been training ourselves to do. Uh, we don't think, maybe. Uh, we don't have the ability to think because we might be so stressed out, but we will naturally gravitate toward that type of behavior and why training is so important. And it's not just in times of crises. It could be training for times of opportunity. So let's say like you're on the street, you're at a restaurant, you meet a friend of a friend, and they find out you're a Christian. They want to know more about your faith and what it means. If you have not been doing the practices that I mentioned, you may not have the ability to, to truly, uh, in a, in a well-fashioned way, articulate what the faith that you believe in actually means and is. And so the training is also to take advantage of opportunity. We need to remember that these spiritual muscles we develop serve the purpose of loving our gods, uh, lo loving our God and loving our neighbors, uh, for advancing God's mission, uh, his church, and to uh, build up our fellow brothers and sisters. So uh, this, these muscles that I'm talking about aren't for the vanity of uh, our own self-righteousness. It's not for us to look in the mirror and to feel good about ourselves or to present ourselves to others. Uh, it's all for a purpose. And that purpose is to advance God's kingdom and to serve him and to build up his church. Uh, we don't engage in action for ourselves or for action for action's sake. So the second part of 1 Corinthians 9.24, Paul says, run in such a way as to get the prize. There is a particular direction, a trajectory, and goal we're supposed to train and aim for when we're doing our training and our conditioning and our running of the race. Uh, Paul runs with a strong strategic purpose in his mind. As he says, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. There's an objective to his actions. The problem is that we can get trapped in the cycle of keeping ourselves busy and doing very churchy things because we feel that that equals uh, making progress. And, you know, like this example of the hamster, like he's just running and running and running and probably feels like he's going somewhere, but he's really going nowhere. In a lot of organizations today and in a lot of work meetings, uh, they kind of go on and, and on, and you might have meeting after meeting after meeting. And there are times when, when I've been in work where I feel like it's death by meeting, like there's just meeting, meeting, meeting. And sometimes people feel like just because you're meeting and meeting for long periods of time, that there's progress, um, but that, that's not true. I mean, there, there are probably some of you that have been in, I don't know Pastor Mark has, agendaless meetings, um, and this could be for work, and it could be for church, and it goes for hours and hours and hours. At the end of it, you're exhausted, and you wonder, what do we actually accomplish? It doesn't seem like we accomplish anything, but some folks feel like by the pure fact that we're together that some progress is made, and we need to not confuse the a flurry of movement or busyness as actual progress. Uh, Paul lays out a very specific goal in his running. His main purpose is to advance the gospel to as many as he can. He discusses this in the section right before our focus passage here. So we're focusing on 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, but in, in verses 19 to 23, I'm not going to put it up, but I'll just read it out loud. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Paul is saying that he will do whatever it takes to achieve his goal, to proclaim God's word and save as many people as he can. He's willing to become a slave and serve. 
He's willing to become a Jew and take on Jewish traditions. He's willing to become weak and forgo the, forgo the privilege that he has as a Roman citizen in his particular context. He's willing to become one um, apart from the law, not having the law, and eat and engage in uh, activities with Gentiles, something that the Jews found repulsive. So he acts in various ways so that he can relate to his target audience and not just with words. Paul's purpose adheres to what Jesus makes clear for all of us as our purpose in our spiritual lives in Matthew 28. And this is, I'm sure, overused, but this is the Great Commission that Jesus leaves us. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is a command not just for Paul, but actually for all of us. Paul advocates engaging in action and engaging in action with purpose. Paul advocates this uh, because also, not just with purpose, we also need a sense of urgency in our action. It's not okay to just participate in the race, uh, uncaring of whether one actually aims to finish uh, or cross the finish line. He says to run in such a way as to get the prize. In the ancient races, there was no second or third place. Uh, there can only be one. And maybe someone can appreciate that movie quote. Um, but imagine that there's competition when you're running a race. No one waits on you. Uh, you have to push yourself. And there's a sense of urgency in all of that. You have to push your hardest. And these days we have, and I guess my children are here, these days we have uh, diminished the need for competitive urgency in our society, especially for the sake of not hurting children's feelings. Uh, there are awards for everything. Uh, there's participation awards for just someone who participates and shows up. And everybody is crowned a winner. You might get a medal and a trophy. And I think that that bleeds into how our spiritual activities and lives are. Um, it seems enough to just show up, even when we're not fully involved. And sadly, I think that breeds spiritual mediocrity. Uh, regularly attending church and volunteering are empty if our daily life does not reflect Christian behavior and there are no efforts to, to, uh, to be made to advance God's mission. Without the drive to strive, I think people fall into the danger of stopping short of completing what their holy duties are. I think the aspiration of people working hard and retiring early uh, is also a very damaging narrative for people to follow, especially when it bleeds into how we behave. Um, even amongst believers, there's this aspiration to retire in our 50s and maybe in our 60s at the earliest. And folks dream about time they're going to spend on the golf course or on cruises they're going to go on, uh, vacations they're going to take. But this is, in my opinion, a, a very modern notion. Uh, we have the luxury now to actually consider this more leisurely lifestyle in our later stages of life uh, when we couldn't do that before. But I, I don't think that's actually a very biblical notion. Um, and despite modern advances in productivity and health care and safety in the world, there's still many problems uh, where Christians are called to uh, answer those issues and where the gospel and Christian work uh, is needed. Now, I'm not saying that we should maintain the same level of intensity throughout our lives and how we do God's work, but, um, but we're still meant to just keep our eyes on the prize, to kind of cross that finish line. Uh, really until the day we die. Um, I had a friend that used to always say, um, I'll rest when I die. And he was a, a ministry worker. And I think uh, that is probably the more biblical um, thing to have in mind when we're actually thinking about how we proceed with the later stages of our lives. So God deserves our first fruit efforts in every part of our lives. And we don't need to officially win to be the winner, but we have to be in it to win it. We have to have a winner's mindset where we're aiming for a goal, we're pushing our hardest, and we actually uh, go for it. Uh, and that only happens with a sense of urgency to advance God's kingdom. Uh, our faith requires action. That action or these actions require uh, purpose, a uh, sense of purpose, framed with purpose, 
And there has to be a level of urgency and immediacy to how we approach um, that work. Now, this is a, a picture of the tortoise and the hare, and it's a very famous fable that, that I assume all of you know. Uh, we need to be like the tortoise in the fable here, where we're constantly pursuing our goal. Slow, well, not uh, slow because he's slow, but steady wins the race. Whereas the hare here is actually just relaxing because he's relying on his talent and his abilities, but he's procrastinating, he's lazy. Uh, we operate in a world now where we have control over so many aspects of our lives. We can control so many things, even from our smartwatches. And we think that we are the ones in control, even of how we handle our kingdom responsibilities that the Lord has given us. Um, sometimes the problem is that it's not that you know, we're slow in getting to the race or st uh, slow in the pace of our race. We haven't even started the race. And the most blatant experience that I've had is when I used to serve as a volunteer at a, at a MBA campus ministry. And I overheard a student speaking to another student, and he was telling this other student that he's going to get this very lucrative job, and that he's going to make up to $10 million, and when he does, that's when he's going to retire early and then start serving the Lord. Um, he thought that it was appropriate to wait and allocate time later on in his life uh, to serve the Lord, and there was no immediacy, and there was no need to start his race uh, anytime soon. You know, this reminds me of the passage in James chapter 4, 13 to 15, where James says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Um, in contrast to the MBA student, one of my inspirations is a Dr. Stuart Wu. Uh, I don't know if some of you might know him, but uh, he's probably one of the most dedicated and faithful servants I've ever met in my life. And I first encountered Dr. Wu when I was doing a short-term medical mission in Zhongshan, China. He's a retired surgeon, and he would regularly, more than once a year, go out to remote parts of China where we would have to track mountainous areas to get to people and provide them medical care and also to share the gospel. Um, he did this into his late 80s, until he was 87 and then passed away. And he never made a complaint that I knew of when he did this. And so I was less than half his age. I was probably a third of his age when I first met him. And I didn't have nearly as much stamina and as much zeal as he did. And I wished to be like him uh, because he kind of constantly had this mindset of finishing the race and finishing well, even until his late 80s. Nope, that's not it. Um, I know this last slide uh, says active rest, um, but actually my focus pivoted toward making sure that we have guardrails. As we, as we run the race and start doing God's work to spread his good news, and make disciples, we need to make sure that we don't take an end justifies the means approach and that how we behave in the process of reaching that goal matters as much as actually reaching that goal. So even if there are great results of people coming to the church, of the church growing, it doesn't give you a pass in how you act in the way getting there. Uh, the Lord cares as much about that journey as he does about the end uh, the end goal that you're striving for. You know, the last uh, part of this passage, Paul emphasizes that he makes sure that he's not disqualified in his attempt to obtain the prize by making sure that he keeps his body in check. In verse 27, he says, No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I believe that he's actually alluding to keeping material and physical temptations at bay. Because earlier in Corinthians, he had addressed the audience to flee from sexual immorality in chapter 6. And I think that he's alluding to this when he's talking about uh, making sure that he's not disqualified. Um, he makes sure that as he's fulfilling the work of God, that he's 
not discredit it and doesn't discredit the Lord's work by his behavior. Sadly, in recent years, we've seen a lot of church leaders, even in our region, uh, fall to sexual sin, and this has had severe impact on, on the churches themselves, as well as people coming to the church. And this is what we want to stay away from. Uh, and it may not be such a blatant sin as sexual immorality. It could be an arrogant attitude. It could be poor financial stewardship. It could be a lack of empathy for the people that we're actually trying to target. In my devotions uh, recently, I, I'm now finishing the book of Deuteronomy. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is getting ready to go up to Mount Nebo and to die, um, and he will never be able to cross into the Promised Land. He gets, a, he gets a view of the Promised Land, but he's not allowed to cross it. And this happened because he actually did not follow uh, God's exact orders. Um, even though he is a champion and a hero of the Bible, and he saved the Israelites from slavery and took him into, um, or got him ready to go into the Promised Land, the Lord prevents him from going in because instead of whispering to a rock to call forth water, he knocks it twice in anger. And this was enough for the Lord to actually prevent him and penalize him from going into the Promised Land. How we uphold ourselves during our work is as important as accomplishing the end result. It's not only about the end point, but how we get there. Not just about the finish line, but how we run the race itself. So I ask all of you, do you even lift bra? Um, if you have been diligently doing God's work, uh, keep at it. And remember that we're in a continuous marathon that requires training, diligence, dedication. But also, the point that I want to highlight uh, and, said, and said that I changed was also to make sure that we rest. Uh, we, I think, especially as um, immigrants or children of immigrants, there's this very strong work ethic that we develop. And sometimes we bring that also into our faith and we don't rest. And the Lord prescribed the Sabbath for us so that we can make sure that we rest as well uh, and are recharged so we can run even stronger and for, um, for God. Um, continuously train yourselves, keep yourselves sharp and ready, um, and your muscles going, you know, reading the word, praying, being in fellowship, serving actively uh, in your communities, and then keeping yourselves accountable while in fellowship with others. And for those of you who are honest and say, no, uh, I don't lift, uh, now's the time to start because there is, um, it's never too late to get started. And it's important to begin when you know that God's calling you to his great commission. So go run the race and do your part uh, in God's great work and get those muscles going and well conditioned. Um, let me end this in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to preach uh, your word and to understand that our faith is one that is demonstrated through action. And Paul uses the visual of running a race. I pray that for each one of us, you help us to understand the areas in our lives where we need to be better conditioned or to start conditioning and to operate these muscles, these spiritual muscles, so that we can be ready uh, for your work that you've called us to, to advance your kingdom and to, um, to make disciples for your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.